Okay, it does. Uh, yep. Okay, I'm gonna broadcast so people can uh, start joining. Sure. I didn't know you can whistle. Oh, of course. <laughs> How many people can do that? Uh, well, I thought it's genetic or something. Oh, really? That's what people say. I don't know. You're having uh, a lot of science, Doc, there. Like, <laughs> I think it's practice or something. I don't know. No, it's just like rolling your tongue or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's why, that's why the genetics come in. Some people can't roll their tongues. Right, right. Yeah, I'm not okay. like... I'm not like making it up though. <laughs> you know, you're accusing me, but I'm... So I have this guy by the name of Sean Tramo. He's a PGY2 and wants to present endocrinology. I think the week after next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I can send him a link, see if he can log in today. And... Mm -hmm. Are we having participants joining? Oh, perfect. Nice. Yeah, yeah. But I can't hear Job. I see him talking, unless he's talking to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's going to be an interventional cardiologist, so yeah. he thinks behind the doors, behind closed <laughs> body and all that. But we'll get him, I guess. Let me see who is here. <clears throat> Leila, Leif, Christian, Bella, Stephanie, Patricia, Patricia, Ndege. Oh, welcome guys. Welcome. Another is it is this episode eight or what? I don't remember. It's because of job though. <laughs> <laughs> How many episodes have we done, Dr. Judy, so far? Uh, you know, I sent you the the list. Let me pull up the email that I sent you, which is like crazy. So yeah. the last one, we there's a big, big call for neuropathology, but I know cardiac is hard and especially yeah. pages. But but I really do have to say uh, a special special thanks to Victor who, uh, who really now. doing a lot of outreach and sharing yeah. this to other people. So. Uh, people who are coming on every time. Yes. Uh, we know that it's. Uh, yeah, but but I have to say a big kudos to to Victor for this. Yeah. So I think we have done like eight sessions so far. Is that correct? Nine. Nine. Okay. That's awesome. I think I wasn't anticipating such, like run. <laughs> so I, I think everybody has been working hard. And that's awesome. Thank you so much, by the Dr. Judy Wawira. I think you you just kind of helped me out whenever I was not there. I will not be there in October, like either two or three weekends, but I know we'll have Pisa will be there or somebody else, you know? Yeah. So I, yeah. yeah. I'm not gonna impose Pisa's all weekends, but it's yeah, really yeah, some so. weekends. <laughs> <laughs> We're not gonna still all have weekends, but yeah. Okay. Okay. I Job think when, whenever Job is ready, he can turn on his camera and we can go on. But for now, we can say, we can catch up, I guess. Let's see the, the song I'm playing for people today. Oh, you're playing some music? Oh, you want no, no, me to let's, let's see, let's see. Oh, nice. Welcome, Ted, Apondi, Brenda, Kamau. Welcome, everybody. Season nine, I believe. Yep. And people who've been emailing about last week's re like recording, but it's not available. Yeah. We, we didn't record. I think. Um, it must have been an, an interesting session. I missed out. It was. <laughs> yeah. 
So welcome guys. Today we have Dr. Job Mogire. Um, he's our next big thing in cardiology. So he has, <laughs> you have a lot of interest in cardiology. Okay. And today I'll take an opportunity to briefly introduce him before he talks. And basically he's an internal medicine resident at KU, Kansas University in Wichita. And he has a lot of interest in cardiology and basically that's why he's here today to teach us through the EKGs. I want to welcome everybody else. Dr. Judy Wawira, she'll be with us for a short while. And Dr. Fiza will be here with us. She's an, a, a PGY1 radiology resident. Yep, sorry. <laughs> and yes. of course we know Dr. Ja Janice Newsom. She's awesome she's one of the um uh, scholars and teachers in emory she's an interventional radiologist she's a lot of she does a lot of things in teaching and she has been passionate and a very passionate co-host so whenever you're ready dr job mogire i'll give you a chance but um if you have a few more minutes okay yep yeah I'll give you a chance to go ahead thanks thank you walter so this, these last four weeks have been crazy. I didn't get enough time to prepare for you an EKG lecture because that would be very visual. I have to find the right uh, kind of EKGs to illustrate what you need to see, especially the, not only the most commonly tested uh, rhythms, but also the features that you really need to know so that when an EKG is done and you have a patient, that you can actually make a difference. So I didn't have enough time what I will do is I will record that lecture by itself with about 30 to 35 EKG, specific EKGs and share, share that. I am interested in cardiology. I'm actually applying for fellowship. I have some interviews coming up, so fingers crossed to see what happens. So, I, uh, yes. I would Did say I get... that um, we, I don't, we can record it. What we could do is if, you, if we tried the flipped classroom, where you send some EKGs to people beforehand, they would try and do them together and you could go through them, record something small, we would send the EKGs and then would have you back again to uh, go through them. That's, and yeah. Them. So it's, um, I agree. Yeah, so yeah. that's what we're doing, but yes. Flip classroom idea is fantastic because then it gives people the opportunity to tackle the EKGs in advance and then, then we can go through them. So I want to, just to get an idea of uh, the kind of audience we have today, I want to see how many of you are preparing for the USMLEs. And uh, I think it might be easier if you just type in the chat box. Uh, just type, type a yes if you are preparing for the USMLE step one, or whichever step if you are preparing for any of the USMLE steps. I'm going to give you a, about 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. Right, I see, I see a number of, uh, number of yeses. Janice, thankfully, no. <laughs> of course. Yes, I see Rotish, Halima, Rita. Pauline, come out. I have to call you Pauline after this. <laughs> Uh, Judy, of course, come on. Mm -hmm. All right, I think I'm going to just, we will we'll approach this session as if we, I mean, there is clinical material to learn. All right, there's mater clinical material to learn uh, that people could pick, but apart from that, I'm going to mostly just present this material as though we are preparing for the steps. Now, this is, this is the, my principle when it comes to learning anything, that the first thing you need to learn is the roadmap. It's the roadmap. It's, I sometimes think that we can waste time when we are trying to learn something, especially for the first time, if we try to dig into the details before we have a, a roadmap. Judy and I, during our first 
two years of medical school, we studied together quite often. And the one thing I found that she did, which I also did, was focusing on the roadmap, taking a topic and knowing the outline of the topic. Because if you know the outline of the topic, then you can tell which sections of the topic you need to review. Because it's, it's very easy for you to waste time reviewing something you already know when you should be spending that time digging deeper in the areas that you don't know. And so I am a firm believer and practitioner in taking any uh, article I'm reading or, or textbook I'm reading and first of all, truly know offhand what the topics are covered in, in that textbook or on, on that article. So what are the topics covered? And then the next level is what are the sections in each of these topics? So if, for example, today we are speaking about cardiology and I'm preparing for the USML list step one. The question is what subtopics in cardiology am I supposed to know? And under each of those subtopics, what are the testable concepts? So that is the next level. What are the testable concepts? The testable concepts might be, uh, for example, the, the drugs. And then from the testable concept is what are now the specific details. So if the concepts are, for example, the medications, classify the medications. Because if I can't classify the medications, when I'm given a question that requires me to, specific, to specifically select a certain medication, I would have trouble. But even if I don't, know, don't remember the specific medications, if I know the sections, the answers given to me, I can even eliminate them just based on what I know from that topic. So let's try an example of uh, uh, cardiology as covered in pathoma. Uh, for my study for the USML step one, I used pathoma extensively and of course the first aid for the USMLE. So I'm going to uh, uh, take you to Hussein Sattar's uh, Fundamentals of Pathology and we will use we will use two of uh, those topics in there. So this session is essentially cardiovascular and in uh, his book he has two chapters, one on uh, vascular pathology and the other one on cardiac pathology. So I will share my screen and could I please see by indication of hands wherever you are, those, especially those studying, please confirm that you have a place to write, you know, you have uh, some space to do rough work where you will scribble out stuff. Could I please see you in the, in the chat box. I'm doing this just to make sure that you guys are uh, active because if you just listen, it's, it's a waste of time. But if you actually have a place, place to write, uh, I need you to have a place to write, a pen and, and uh, some space, whether it's a book or uh, just some sheets of paper on which you can scribble out and write stuff. If you don't, please grab one. Otherwise, this becomes a... It becomes just something that you hear and it goes away. Okay, hopefully most of you, uh, especially those of you who are preparing for Jenny's has one that is pink. <laughs> yes. All right, let's go. And I'm going to share my screen. And that is vascular pathology. And so we will run through vascular pathology probably two or three times. And we are going through it as though I'm also you know, studying for this exam. And just so that we, we dissect this, this chapter a little deeper. Okay, so vascular pathology. So we'll just look through. Uh, you don't need to write anything right now. Vascular pathology is covered by uh, Hussein Sattar in his book, Pathoma. So the... The topic is vascular pathology. The segments, as you, we scroll through, you will see what the segments are. So vasculitis, the definition of vasculitis, nobody's going to necessarily test you on that. But the big concept here is that vasculitis can be classified into three. That's large vessel vasculitis, medium vessel, and small vessel vasculitis. And the, the main difference is that the muscular arteries are the subdivision. So remember those, that is the overall subdivision. Then under large uh, vessel vasculitis, you have temporal giant cell arteritis, 
you have Takayasu as the two main ones. They share a lot of features across each of them, but they have differentiators. Medium vessel vasculitis, you have polyarthritis nodosa, Kawasaki, and Borgia disease. You may pronounce it very differently. Something very specific about Borgia disease, it's, it's association with smoking. And you have small vessel vasculitis, Wegener granulomatosis, microscopic polyangitis, Chag Strauss syndrome, and Henoch Schonlein papura. So, on the space you have, can you write down, you have large vessel, medium vessel, and small vessel vasculitis. Can you write down what the, the types you remember under each of the three categories? And as soon as I see yes, two yeses from uh, some of you guys, I, I, we will move to the next section. Because that is the that is the power of uh, learning actively. If you, can, if you can reproduce this, when you go back to read the specific details under each of them, it becomes very easy. So please write down the, those types. And as soon as I see, as soon as you are done, please write, uh, type a yes, as we, as we, suit, we see two, right? Okay, hypertension. Hypertension is very, is, is fairly straightforward. There are concepts which are tested directly. I mean, it's primary hypertension, secondary hypertension, but the most important uh, part of this is to look at the common causes of uh, the secondary, secondary hypertension and what workup uh, would be done, and then differentiate between benign and malignant hypertension. And a further concept that is not in this book is uh, something that when you practice clinically is very common, that's hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency. All right? Remember we are still in uh, uh, vascular pathology. So let's look at arteriosclerosis, the hardening of blood vessels. Arteriosclerosis is subdivided into two types. There is atherosclerosis, and then there is arteriolosclerosis. One of the more important concepts that are tested in, uh, in this area relates to what you will see in cardiac disease but prevention, mod modification of uh, risk factors by use of medications such as statins, lifestyle uh, change, that would be, would be tested. And then now most of these concepts will cross over to cardiology in terms of how the complications of what I'm highlighting here, how these complications lead to cardiac disease and sometimes lead to other pathologic manifestations, especially in the kidneys and uh, peripheral articular disease. The part you also would need to pay attention to in this section of uh, the vascular pathology is arteriolosclerosis, especially as it relates to uh, comorbidities such as hypertension and, uh, and blood pressure. So the important thing is to, to be able to off the head remember so that your aim is to come to a time when you can flip through this book, Pathoma, within an hour and you enhance, because you, you, you will open a page and you're like, I know this part, I don't think I know this part, so that you review the parts that you don't know as well. And this is a book that I ended up knowing almost back to front and it changed my performance on the USMLEs. Now, uh, Mockenberg is very specific. The when, whenever you will see it tested, it will be a very, very specific question and the time I've never I've seen it in any of the main exams but the times I've seen it in the question banks you have a, a picture of a, a vessel with you see this this picture in the middle looks something close to that with a, a lot of calcium deposits in the on the muscular wall and it's it's a it you will have an image uh, accompanying it so at, at, uh, atherosclerosis and arteriolosclerosis are the main things in arteriosclerosis, where arterio is just the hardening. Heart arterial relates to the small vessels and atherosclerosis affects the bigger uh, uh, vessels. Uh, 
there isn't much for us to even do there. But just remember those three, and then of course, Monk and Bang. Aortic dissection. The, there are three, three, wall, three layers in the, the, on the structure of the aorta's wall. Remember the, the, those three, and remember which layer is affected, right? And then what correlations you will be tested on. The, uh, and we will we'll come back and look at those. There are two types, thoracic and abdominal. In surgery, they call them type A and type B. It's the same thing. Uh, then, uh, the, the, then you have the tumors, which concludes this chapter. The important one here is uh, the Kaposi sarcoma. And then in, in uh, dermatology, you will see certain types of hemangiomas, such as cherry hemangioma. But the important one here is uh, uh, angiosarcoma. And of course, it's association, right? Okay, so let's run through uh, this just one more and see what, what are some of the more specific details that we need to pay attention to. So we're essentially reviewing this chapter together. Right, so in large vessel uh, vasculitis, I will, I'm, I'm just going to ask you a couple of, uh, you know, off the top of, uh, my head questions and to see uh, to see what you know. So, for example, uh, what let, let's 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 go through uh, temporal. Um, that is the uh, under the large vessel. You have these two under large vessel vasculitis, temporal or giant cell arteritis, and uh, Takayasu. Now, I'm hiding this so that it doesn't uh, uh, create issues. There is always a confusion between Takayasu. And Kawasaki. Takayasu and Kawasaki. This, in any USMLE step one exam you do, you will have both or at least one of them. So now we know there are three categories that is large vessel, medium vessel, and small vessel. Takayasu is a large vessel vasculitis. But what, what are some of the clinical features that come off? On the top of your head when you think about Takayasu. And you're not going to, don't uh, type anything, just write down like two or three things, but actually write down something, <laughs> one or two things. Or at least think about it. And then the other one under large vessel is giant cell. When you think about giant cell, if you start reading a clinical scenario, what tells you that this is giant cell arteritis? So for giant cell, you should remember that there are two types, which is not mentioned here. There is intracranial and extracranial giant cell arteritis. Most of the time when we think about giant cell arteritis, which we call temporal arteritis, we think of a patient presenting with a, a unilateral headache with a loss of vision on the, in the affected eye and tenderness and because you will do biopsy and you will give them cortical steroids which is what we see uh, discussed here so most of the time it's a, it's a lady it's a woman more than 50 years old who presents with visual disturbance and headache on one side on the same side that is affected with jaw uh, claudication they will have elevated esr the the more the question that i have seen and of course i'm not going to identify where and for obvious reasons because some of these questions have been in uh, settings from which i'm not supposed to share material out but the one variation of temporal arthritis that you are likely to miss in the exam is when they present they present you with all the clinical features for example elevated esr they give you a 50 year old uh, woman, but they don't give you the features associated with the temporal artery itself. They don't give you a headache on one side, they don't give you change in vision, but then they don't, they don't give you other features that could suggest that this is Takayasu. So there is aortic giant cell arteritis, like the, it, because this is a large vessel arteritis. So let's remember to take it beyond 
to take it beyond uh, what you see up here, what you see in, on the temporal artery. And then uh, I've seen uh, Mudoni Mwangi, that's an extremely important association. It's an extremely important association. It's the association between giant cell arteritis with polymyalgia rheumatica. So what happens is that they will present to you a patient with polymyalgia rheumatica, but they give you vascular symptoms, excluding the symptoms that you have up here. And in this case, the, 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 one of the most common questions you'll be asked is what is the next, what is the, the, the you know, when you think about the series of treatment, what goes first? Of course, diagnosis is extremely important, but uh, steroids go first. Whatever you do, steroids go first. It takes up to two weeks for the pathological changes in the artery to disappear. So you give steroids as soon as you can, because otherwise you lose vision on that side. So the other one is Takayasu. Takayasu, so the, the main difference is the the age, Takayasu will occur mostly uh, in uh, younger people. Unfortunately, for some reason, this uh, vasculitis occur more commonly in women. ESR is elevated in both, and you, the, it can affect, it's large vessel disease, it can affect the same part of, uh, the, of the, the large vessels, but you, most of the time you differentiate them based on uh, the association of temporal arteritis with, with polymyalgia rheumatica and the age. Otherwise, whenever I have rotated in rheumatology, the rheumatologists will tell you that they don't know whether it's takayasu or temporal uh, giant cell arteritis. For example, if you have a 48 year old, that is so close in between the ages. So you would use uh, this differentiators, otherwise they can both be the same. But in the, the exam, they will be totally <laughs> totally uh, presented to you in a way that you can differentiate them. Temporal arthritis will always be presented alongside with polymyalgia rheumatica, or they will present it so classically with jaw claudication and uh, unilateral headache and loss of vision that you can't miss it. You treat all of them with steroids. You start steroids as soon as you make the diagnosis. You proceed from there. Medium vessel vasculitis are sometimes the, the, the more confusing ones. Remember, I asked you the question in terms of what's the difference between Takayasu and Kawasaki. You see Takayasu happens, it, it, it's an adult disease and it affects the large vessels. Kawasaki is a small vessel disease. It's mostly in children and it will have extensive mucosal su surface involvement. You have conjunctivitis, erythematosis, Erythematous rash of the soles and palms. You see that number two over there. That's what I'm speaking about. So there is extensive. If they present a patient to you, a little boy or girl who looks like they probably could be having a URI, but then they mentioned that this child has red eyes. They have uh, mucous membranes are inflamed. This child is very sick, high, has high fevers and is crying. That and then they ask you, what? is uh, the most, you know, like somehow they lead you to thinking about what's most likely to happen in terms of vascular complications. They are asking you about coronary artery involvement because these children end up with coronary aneurysms. And later on, you would find a seven-year-old, 10-year-old having a myocardial infarction. That's because they suffered Kawasaki when they were younger. So Kawasaki coronary, that sound might remind you, Kawasaki coronary, but Takayasu, I think of Takayasu, it has so many A's, Takaota, Takayasu. It's, it, it helps you remember that Takayasu is a large vessel disease. Kawasaki is a small vessel disease. And you, the child, it's a child who is very sick and they, they have inflammation everywhere, from the eyes, the mouth, the palms, the soles of their feet. The whole child is inflamed. That is Kawasaki. If the whole child is inflamed, everything can be affected. The most lethal consequence is what happens to their arteries. And the most specific question you will be tested on is coronary aneurysms and its association with uh, myocardial infarction uh, later on. The first one that we skipped is polyarteritis nodosa. The one specific question you will be asked, what is the one association that you will be asked about in uh, polyarteritis nodosa? Can somebody type it? 
and I hope, oh, I hope you guys don't have your pathoma open because then we'll just be, we are running around in circles. <laughs> Please don't open your own uh, pathoma. All right, Pauline, hepatitis C virus, and Sheila, uh, Ruo, fibrinoid necrosis, Maro Ahmed, hepatitis B. So the answer is hepatitis B virus. It's association with hepatitis B virus. And you will see, you will see that up here. So fibrinoid necrosis is the pathology that you will see. And if they give you a picture of fibrinoid necrosis, you'll see a blood vessel with a wall that is full of fibrinoid material. Like you'll see a lot of pink in, uh, in that wall. Uh, so necrotize, it's a necrotizing vasculitis that involves a lot of organs. So this, this shouldn't, uh, this, no, this, it, it can happen in uh, any age, but mostly it will be present in adults. So the symptoms will be, you will have a diffuse array of symptoms. The most common thing they will ask you is uh, the association with hepatitis B virus. And this, will you expect that they, they will have an active hepatitis B uh, infection. Therefore, you, you, will be, you will see the surface antigen present, which means they are infected. Of course, remember when you think about hepatitis B, if you see the envelope, the envelope antigen, it means there is active uh, replication that is going on. And if you see the surface antibody, it means that patient is immune to hepatitis B. So when you see the hepatitis B surface antigen, it means there is infection. You don't know whether it is acute or chronic, but it is, there is definitely infection that is going on. The other association that you you will be sometimes be tested on. For example, they give you this case and they tell you this patient was put on uh, appropriate treatment. They present to you polyarthritis notosa and tell you the patient was put on appropriate treatment. And what complication do you anticipate? Anybody? What complication would you anticipate to happen from the appropriate treatment? Because that's how your summary questions will appear to you. It's never straightforward. It's they give you a case scenario, then they go to the next step and they perform the next step for you, then they go to the next. So the question is, what is the appropriate treatment? The appropriate treatment is Sheila Ruo, yes, that's correct. So the appropriate treatment is a combination of steroids, combined steroids with anybody. It's going to cause hemorrhagic cystitis. So what's that? Yes. Cyclophosphamide. So you treat it with cyclophosphamide. So again, temporal arteritis, we associate it with polymyalgia rheumatica. Uh, the main difference is that uh, it appears in older patients and you differentiate it by the age and also if you are given classical symptoms. Otherwise, it can be either that or Takayasu. And the difference between Takayasu and Kawasaki is Takayasu is a, is a Takaota. It's in the bigger vessels and Kawasaki is in small vessels. Polyarteritis nodosa, its association with hepatitis B, you treat it with cyclophosphamide, which can cause uh, hemorrhagic cystitis as uh, Sheila Ruo uh, mentioned. The next part is Kawasaki, which we've already spoken about. The child is inflamed from head to toe. Treat, it, treat them with IVIG. IVIG. The next one is Boerger disease. What is the most common association with Boerger disease? Anybody? Yep, yep, oh, you guys are on fire. It is associated with Boerger disease. What is the most common way that this, this would be presented to you? It will be a patient who has DASH syndrome. What, what is the name of the syndrome? 
because I remember seeing a question uh, like that. So claudication is is a possibility. I uh, have blue toes. So blue toes can appear because of ischemia, but what is the other thing, the other reason why we sometimes have blue toes? Especially when there is a change of temperature. Yes, Raynaud's, Raynaud's. So gangrene, gangrene is a vascular phenomenon and gangrene is irreversible, but Raynaud's is, is not a vascular phenomenon. So Bueja disease associated very highly with uh, smoking and the treatment is smoking cessation, period. I think we have, we have dissected that. All right, so once again, just by the time you leave this, this chapter, you will hate vasculitis because we'll have run through that so many times. Temporal arteritis, giant cell arteritis, and an old lady with a headache and visual loss and can be associated with polymyalgia rheumatica, treat with steroids as soon as possible, do a biopsy. Takayasu is almost the same presentation except for the cranial, it doesn't go up to, to the head, the Takayasu. It's, it's actually the same disease, but it is differentiated just because of how much severe the complications of temporal arteritis can be when they involve the temporal artery. Medium vessel disease, you just need to remember three diseases under here. Polyarteritis nodosa with hepatitis B and, and uh, Kawasaki with the heart. Bwaja is a very specific question. It's a necrotizing uh, vasculitis. Quit smoking. This part, the small vessel vascul vasculitis, is extremely important. I promise you 100%. In those 300 plus questions in any step one exam, you will have at least two of this. At least two. So of all the small vessel vasculitis, there is only one. Only one of them has C anchor. Which one? Guys, I really, really I want to, to insist that please, please don't, don't use any reference material when we are doing this. Because if you use any reference material, you will just be wasting time. And this is for your integrity and my integrity. Don't use any reference material, please. Because then it's uh, some of the places where we will struggle, it will help you and I because when our mind searches for an answer and it can't find it, when we go back to review, that is the first thing the mind is looking for. So Wajana is associated, it's the only one in which we have a C anchor. Which one doesn't have any, well, you don't need to do any anchor testing? Remember there are four of them. So in other words, what I'm doing is I'm presuming that we already know the four. We already know what the four are, and then now the specific questions under each of them. And that's why it's extremely important to know, it's extremely important to know the outline, what the outline is. Then you can fit in the specific uh, points. All right, good. We are ready to go through all of them. I see all the answers uh, from MT, I don't know the full name, Rita. Uh, Irene, Captain Gay, Maru Ahmed, Doreen, and DC. Uh, I've, I know all these people, but we have never met face to face. <laughs> all right, so here we are. Let's, let's go through the small vessel vasculitis. So, Wedna granulomatosis, it has a new name, uh, but that is for rheumatologists to deal with. We'll just keep going with this. So, the the important thing to remember about uh, Wesner is, is how extensive it is. The parts, the, the, the bigger difference between Chag Strauss and uh, the clinical in terms of manifestation, the, the bigger difference is that Wesner granulomatosis is the only one with the C anchor and it's the only one that affects the nasopharynx. So if you have a patient with a chronic, a chronic uh, rhinitis for some reason, they have hematuria, they have a uh, hemoptysis, that begins to point you towards uh, wedding granulomatosis. A middle-aged man with ulceration up here, hemoptysis down here, my, and, and blood. 
So blood in here, blood in the nose, blood in the lungs, blood in the kidneys. You are thinking a wage in a granulomatosis. So they have glomerulonephritis. They have, uh, they can have pulmonary uh, hemorrhage or they have some pathology going on in the lung from the presentation you are given and they have something going on up here. You biopsy them and you give them cyclophosphamide and you give uh, and steroids. Anticipate uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. They are the only ones on whom you will find C anchor activity. Where's in a granulomatosis? Microscopic polyangitis. Which organs are affected by microscopic polyangitis? Any answers? Which organs are affected by microscopic polyangitis? And which, which anchor are you looking for in uh, microscopic polyangitis? Yep, it is kidney, it is lung, it is P anchor, polyangitis and P anchor. That's a very easy association. Uh, Wegener, sometimes I used to call it Wegener granulomatosis to remember the C anchor. And this is uh, microscopic polyangitis and the P anchor that is found in it. So multiple organs, multiple organs, but most classically, you will be presented with symptoms in the lung and in the kidney. So if they give you a patient who has hematuria and hemoptysis, but they don't give you something to do with uh, rhinitis, they are moving you away from vaginal granulomatosis, moving you towards poly microscopic polyangitis. It is called polyangitis because the angitis can be anywhere, anywhere. Polyangitis, P anchor, lung, kidney, you exclude the nasopharynx. Chag Strauss, what, what organs are affected by Chag Strauss syndrome? What organs are affected? What is the main type? What is the main type of immune cell you will see in Chag Strauss? It is so you will see your synophils. Uh -huh. What type of uh, what what uh, immune what immune molecules do you anticipate to be elevated in Chang Strauss? You guys are running with this. All right, let's review it. Necrotizing granul granulomatous disease that can affect multiple organs, multiple organs, but especially the lungs and heart. So well, now we have three of them. If you have the nose. You have the lungs and you have the kidney. That is vaginal granulomatosis. If you are only given the lungs and the kidney, that is P anchor, which is polyangitis, microscopic polyangitis. If they don't give you the kidneys, that is Chag Strauss. So in other words, if they keep you only within, within the, the chest, if, if everything that is being affected is in the chest, that is similar to asthma, which is another association, and you expect high eosinophils, that is Chag Strauss. Chag Strauss, chest only, lungs and, and heart. If they give you nose, lungs, and kidney, that is vaginal granulomatosis. Even the name is so long, it extends from the nose through the lungs all the way to the kidney. But if they give you everything, if they give you the kidneys and give you the lungs, but they don't give you the, the, nostri, the nasopharynx, that is microscopic polyangitis. And the last one is henoch schonlein papura. What molecule do you anticipate in a henoch schonlein papura? And what's the, most, what's the biggest symptom you have to look for? Yep, 
There you have it. You guys are really, I love that you are actively engaging. I would like to see more people engaged. Here we are. So it's skin. If you see skin, uh, you anticipate that this is, so it, it is papura. It's, this is not, these are not petechiae. Petechiae are, so, so the, the clinical presentation, when I have seen uh, this clinically, it is the the presentation can it can be confusing because you have it starts off with micro papyri very tiny papyri which then grow up so that now it becomes an obvious papyri so initially it looks like it's particular bleeding because if it's particular uh, bleeding anytime you have petechiae you think platelets petechiae platelets those microscopic bleeds but when you have papyri it is most of the time something something vasculitic so in this case, you're speaking about Henoxion lane uh, papyra. It is, you, you, you will be tested about its association with the GI manifestations, and you'll be, associated, you'll be tested about skin. You might be given a skin sample, or, I mean, a picture of the skin. And of course, it's IgA. So we have covered all the three categories of uh, the vasculitis. Large basal vasculitis, temporal or giant cell arteritis, elderly woman, hurting one, one side of the head with losing vision, and their ESR is elevated. If those features are not present, you might be being directed towards Takayasu. Remember Takayasu, Takaota, that is a big vessel and it's different from Kawasaki, which we'll see in the medium vessel disorders. You treat both of them with steroids. Medium vessel disorders. You have polyarteritis nodosa, which you will see in multiple uh, organs. Kawasaki, and you have Bueja. Bueja, stop smoking. Kawasaki, do an echo during the time the child is having the presentation. So the next, the next step is usually echo during the time the child is having the active disease, and then the, the child will require follow-up with six monthly echoes. So you won't be tested about how frequently you need to screen, but echo, echo, echo to follow up uh, this child. Remember polyarteritis nodosa, it's a fibrinoid necrosis, and it's association with hepatitis B. Small vessel vasculitis, vaginal granulomatosis, nose, lung, kidney, C anchor. Cyclophosphamide, uh, hemorrhagic cystitis, microscopic polyangiitis, P anchor, and treat with treat the same involves the lungs and the kidneys, spares the nostrils. Chag Strauss syndrome associated with asthma, eosinophils, and it, it is P anchor, spares the nostrils or the nasopharynx and spares the the kidneys. P anchor. So P anchor in polyangiitis, microscopic polyangiitis, and Chag Strauss. C anchor for vaginal granulomatosis, and IgA in Henoxion lane papura, which will present with papura. Henoxion lane papura, the, 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 this clue is in the name papura, are palpable uh, phenomena that you can feel under this, uh, the skin. That will be tested. Most of the time, we, we don't even uh, even uh, treat those. Do you feel confident that if you saw a question on uh, vasculitis, that you'll actually nick it, and that the next time you go back to this book, that that section won't you won't take your time because you just need to remind yourself of the specific things? Can I see any anybody? Is this structure useful? Would you prefer the uh, we we try a different structure? We do a different structure, or, or is it okay? Doc, I think I like it. That's amazing. Yep. And I think you used a good concept when you were revising for your exams. You scored very high. I think I should have talked to you in advance. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, good. I see a uh, good response. In hypertension, we, we, we won't have a lot to do here. My goodness, I, I can't emphasize how important vasculitis is going to be. You, you will not miss two 
to five questions. Two to five questions. I'm not going to give you the exact number of questions I had, but there were more than four. And I remember what those questions were. It's extremely, extremely high yield. But not only for this exam, but it, it also makes you a very a different kind of clinician when this, this lady who is 65 year old has been being treated for, uh, for migraine comes in and this time around you are able to examine, you examine the vision and you find that the vision is blurred on one side, you palpate, you find what's going on, you get an ESR and it's elevated and you are thinking the next step. That's what makes you, takes you a, a step ahead of where the nurse would have stopped being able to seeing blood in the urine and you you go beyond prostate uh, cancer being able to think slightly further ahead so that because vas vessels are everywhere you see this patient who is being treated for asthma and it's not improving you test and find that they have uh, very high peripheral eosinophilia and here you are this guy has been put on anti-TB medications for six months. There's no, there's no improvement. They are, they are on asthma treatment. It's not improving. You suddenly are beginning to think about Chag Strauss syndrome. Start treating them, and they actually improve. That's what makes you a clinician. It's able to go beyond where everyone else is stopping by mastering some of this material. All right, so hypertension. The, the most commonly tested concept of, in hypertension is secondary hypertension that is due to hyperreninemia. And hyperreninemia can be from, that's a high renin, can be from a multitude of factors, but the most commonly tested one is causes of unilateral renal artery stenosis. It's different types of causes of renal artery stenosis. You put a patient on ACE inhibitors and their blood pressure, instead of getting better, gets worse, and their renal function gets even worse. That will be tested. And the other, the, the, so, so the question is, what is causing that? So if you are given a young lady, if you are given a young patient who has, I mean, young people shouldn't be having secondary hypertension very severe resistant hypertension, which is what we call renovascular hypertension. If you look at, uh, on this uh, page, look at uh, the last point, point number five, uh, oh, actually in C, atherosclerosis in the elderly or fibromuscular dysplasia in young females. Those are the two concepts that you need to remember that would be tested. So for example, I have seen a question where you are given an elderly patient who has a claudication when they walk, right? And then they are hypertensive. They are put on a combination of regimen, uh, including SE inhibitors. Instead of improvement, their the hypertension worsens. The reason is the kidney that is uh, on the side where there is atherosclerosis, remember if there is atherosclerosis in the legs, it means any arteries can be involved. So on the side that is affected, when you put them on antihypertensives, that kidney receives even less blood flow, which means it, it ends up producing even more renin, which activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis and makes the hypertension worse. And that leads to resistant hypertension. So Elderly patient with uh, any risk factors for uh, atherosclerosis, you anticipate that they have uh, atherosclerosis of the renal arteries, especially when it's unilateral, that would cause resistant hypertension. The other one is young females with fibromuscular dysplasia. So if, if I have a physical book, I would circle those two, because once you've understood everything else under this primary and secondary hypertension, those are the two associations you need to, to remember that would end up to be tested, okay? Then the, the other question about benign and malignant hypertension, just need to remember the definition of a hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency. Severe elevation of blood pressure is urgency by itself. If there are symptoms, it is emergency and organ damage symptoms. Then let's go to arteriosclerosis. It's, uh, it's, it's an area that could be tested a lot of the times whenever I have seen questions 
they tend to have questions which have images associated with uh, with this part. Uh, so let me see whether there is any specific uh, association that we we could uh, speak about. Uh, this I will, I will leave this for you to for you to review uh because the i don't i do not there is no specific question that uh stands out one important one i could i could mention is uh, a patient undergoes uh some vascular procedure of some type and they end up with uh acute respiratory distress or uh, acute hypoxic hypoxic respiratory failure uh so the question is why So the embolization resulting from uh, vascular procedures is a common thing that uh, you would be tested on. A patient presents with a shortness of breath and they had uh, some procedure, maybe they had repair of a uh, aortic aneurysm two days ago. So you just need to remember that embolization of, uh, of cholesterol Cholesterol, uh, cholesterol molecules through the blood vessel, they land in the lungs and they cause, they can cause ARDS. Everything else on the, in this section is uh, fairly straightforward. I do not see anything that you specifically need to remember. With regards to aortic dissection, two types of aortic dissection. The most important things to remember here is Ehlers Danlos and Marfan syndrome. These things are very rare in real life, but they are very common. If there was an epidemiology of the conditions available on uh, USMLE exams, it will be very different from real life epidemiology. You get tested on the rare things, especially the complex things, things that are confusing, for example, vasculitis, because that then helps you to think about them and to exclude them just because they are, they are rare and they would require you to, to pay attention to them for you to pick them. So, Marfan syndrome and Ehlers Danlos syndrome. And that you, you hopefully will review that in biochemistry in terms of this specific, uh, the specific reasons. So Marfan syndrome, Ehlers Danlos syndrome. The other one that you ha have to pay attention to is what, is what is the most common infectious cause of aortic dissection? or aortic aneurysms and aortic dissection. Infectious cause, it tends to cause, yes, you guys are on fire, yes, syphilis, syphilis. So you need to, you pay attention to that. And, and remember, I'm seeing I, I missed, probably missed two questions. All right, so I see two people uh, who had, uh, that is MT and Bernard, uh, Serwanga, hopefully I'm not butchering your name. I'm not looking at the question and answers. Please uh, put, if you can, put your answers in the in the chat box, so that then because then then it it comes live uh, immediately. Uh, please use the the chat box. Yes. So syphilis, you need to pay attention to that. If you are given a patient. You're given a patient with uh, chest pain, right? And this chest pain is because of aortic dissection. What symptoms, what, what, can you describe the pain? I mean, this is a very basic question, but let, let's ask, can you, what kind of pain? What will differentiate pain from aortic dissection from other pains? I think that's, that's the question. It's a straightforward question, but let's just answer it. What would differentiate pain from, uh, from aortic dissection from other pains. Yeah, you guys got it. So it is, it is a pain, it's very severe pain that radiates to the back, right? It's pain that radiates to the back. How that, does that differ from angina? How does that, let me tell you something guys. So I, those of you who know the, the name Mogire, I come from, uh, from Kisi, that is in Western Kenya. I grew up 
never knowing that there was anything like chest pain because in our language, we don't have an equivalent language for chest pain. What we have is called ekeuno. And ekeuno is like a blunt force. So it's, it's I remember when one of my uncles uh, had ekeuno, people gave up on him. And the truth is, he died. He, he ended up dying. And that's because ekeuno it constitutes all kinds of severe chest pain from pneumonia to aortic dissection. Any pain in the chest in my community is called ekeuno, right? And then, of course, when I came to medical school, that's when I started to realize they, these pains can be you know, described uh, differently. That's why chest pain is, is such an important con uh, question because one symptom can present a ton, a ton of, uh, of things. Another question, which category, which group of patients would present with an, a heart attack, but they have uh, atypical symptoms? Yes, you guys got it. So, so the most common group that will have uh, um, uh, confusing symptoms are those who have multiple comorbidities. So for example, if a patient has already has inherent chest pain for some reason, they have neuropathy or they had uh, varicella zoster, they have, uh, they have already pre-existing pain, it can be confusing whether this is old pain or new pain. For example, a patient who constantly has a uh, esophageal gastroesophageal reflux. So patients will already have some form of pre-existing pain. The other category is uh, patients with uh, florisarcatic symptoms and patients who have uh, difficulties expressing themselves. So there's the question of, can the patient describe the symptoms? But among patients who can describe their symptoms, diabetics will come in, they are having a heart attack, but they don't experience it like other, other patients. And also women. I have seen several examples when women come in with a heart attack, they have a myocardial infarction, but even the radiation of the pain sometimes can be different. I remember a classic patient who ended up having 100% occlusion of, the, of the, the right coronary artery, but her pain was radiating to the right shoulder, nowhere else, just the right shoulder. And, uh, she was a woman in her late 50s, she wasn't diabetic. So diabetics and women, that's one category. But so that is those who are able to describe their symptoms. But what if they are not able to describe their symptoms? It can be, you know, the elderly or uh, patients with uh, uh, mental health disorders, patients with uh, maybe they have some language deficits. Of course, if, if they, they've had a stroke and they can't uh, speak for themselves, the other category that's confusing is patients who already have pain syndrome. They have the diffuse, for example, patients with uh, fibromyalgia. Patients with fibromyalgia will come in present complaining of chest pain, but they're also complaining of shoulder pain, back pain, and knee pain. You end up thinking of a uh, complex pain syndrome. And differentiating this chest pain, de determining whether it is new pain, whether it is worse than before, whether it's, it has the characteristics. What are the other characteristics of chest pain that makes you think that this is probably uh, related to a heart attack? What are, this, what are some of the specific things that makes, will steer you to think that this is probably related to a myocardial infarction? Yep, yep, so it is, it cannot, I, I like your, your response, so it cannot, you, you cannot reproduce that pain. It, it's worse with exertion, it's relieved by rest, it's relieved by nitroglycerin. It is dull, it's not sharp, it's dull. The, uh, who, somebody mentioned, uh, yes, Rita, chest pain with a sense of impending doom, right? And uh, 
yeah so let's let's just quickly review the, the uh, this the aortic dissection so you have uh, there are two types of uh, aortic dissection type 1 and type 2 which of the two do you treat medically which of which would require uh, surgery So the, the more proximal it is to the heart, the greater the need for surgery. If it's very proximal to the heart, uh, surgery. If it's more distal, you can do uh, medication management. Uh, you give beta blockers to slow down the heart rate, because the heart rate is the, most, the, the strongest uh, predictor of uh, continued uh, dissection. What is the reason why you do surgery for proximal dissection? The reason why surgery is done for proximal dissection is proximal dissection is most of the time related to the sheer stress that that part of the aorta from the aortic root, the first about 10 centimeters of the aorta experience, such that if there is dissection there, whenever there is dissection, it causes hemodynamic uh, derangement, which automatically leads to increase in heart rate, and that causes more, more distress. Therefore, whenever it starts, most of the time it's going to continue. And yes, Janice, you do that to preserve flow into the coronaries, because once that dissection starts coming down, you will cut off blood flow, you will, I mean, you will tear off the coronaries, that can continue until you tear off and you end up with a, a tamponade, right? You end up with tamponade. Abdominal aortic aneurysm. The main question, the, the main, the main uh, things that would, you would end up uh, being tested on here is, uh, of course, what's the treatment? It's going to be, to be surgical, but surgery only up to a certain point. Uh, diagnosing it is you have a pulsatile abdominal mass and uh, the complications uh, for example which which renal artery and vein which renal artery which renal vein crosses over the aorta is it the right or the left anatomically speaking Yes, so the left, the left renal uh, vein crosses in front of the aorta, under which mesenteric artery, under which mesenteric artery does the, renal, the left renal vein pass? It is the superior mesenteric artery. Therefore, when you have a uh, aortic aneurysm, so you have the aortic aneurysm, if this is the aneurysm here, and this is the superior mesenteric artery, and in between this space, you have uh, the left renal vein, that can be compressed. So that's a common association that, uh, that would, you would usually be, you, that you'll end up being tested on. Which of the renal arteries rises higher than the other when, when you think about uh, the renal arteries? Mm -hmm. I'm waiting to see more answers. I've seen left, right, right, right. Janice, I've seen your <laughs> response. Thank you. I'm asking you guys that question because it's, it's important. 
if when you're having dissection, if one of the arteries is going to be affected, it's going to be one of the two. I want you to think anatomically on which side is the kidney lower than the other side. The clue is on one side you have the liver, on the other side you have the spleen. I think that's, that's an anatomy question. Please put that in mind and go, go review because, and I would like you to please use an image. Don't, don't, don't use a, don't, don't try to read it theoretically, use an image. So that's, that's my challenge to you. Number one, look at the drainage, the, look at the renal drainage from the scrotum, renal drainage from the scrotum. One of the veins goes directly into one of the renal veins. One of the veins from the scrotum goes into one of the renal veins. And I would like you to, to, to look at, to actually look at an image and see, because I don't have any images I would show you, right? One of the renal arteries arises lower than the other. So when you're having dissection that is descending, one of the kidneys is going, and this is, I have had a case where a patient came in with, with, with a renal infarction on one side. So this is extremely important. I have seen questions. I've seen questions that test this. So I would like you to do that. Then there is compression of one of the renal veins because of, uh, look at this, where the celiac trunk arises, pedo mesenteric artery, the, and feed them a synthetic artery. Those are, uh, so I'm doing this so that we can move on to the next part. And then the associations of Kaposi sarcoma with HIV AIDS and uh, chemotherapy uh, patients. And uh, the cherry hemangiomas, that's not, it's, it's not here, but cherry hemangiomas, cherry hemangiomas usually resolve. Kevin, I've seen your answer, left gonad vein drains into the left renal vein and may present with hydrocele in case of renal mass obstruction. So uh, Kevin, I would like you to go check, is it hydrocele or varicocele? Is it hydrocele or varicocele? Uh, I wouldn't give you, uh, Walter has already, guys are already raining on the parade, but I would like you to actually look at an atlas and see, see this. It will register in your mind in a way that you will never, never forget it. All right, guys, we have uh, spent quite a bit of time on uh, vasculitis. I hope you picked something from this area. Cherry hemangioma, if you look at this picture, the cherry hemangioma, the treatment, the treatment. Janice, thank you and see you again soon. Thank you very much for your kind words. Cherry hemangioma, any treatment? No. You just need to be able to identify it if you're questioned on this and you will most likely see a picture of this. So the things from uh, the skin that you are definitely uh, going to see include, include this. Seborrheic dermatitis, seborrheic keratosis. You will see those. So some of these skin manifestations, you will see if they present papyri, they will present papyri. And remember, of course, which vasculitis, vasculi, vasculitis will be associated with papyra, particularly Henoxion lane papyra, which is associated with IgA, most often occurs after some GI infection. Cardiac pathology, we, is Walter, Is water on? Yes. 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 I want to see. I want to see how much more time we have, so that I know how, how what uh, what uh, section we may have time to review. I think you can review what we just went through. Then we can give you yes. more time. Yes. Then so that we can. I mostly we do it for one hour. If we go over, we do one hour twenty minutes okay. because of the concentration. Yeah, no, no, then, yeah, yep. then I think we just, let's just run through what we have reviewed today. That will be it for now. And uh, yeah, then we'll, we'll link up again another time. Uh, all right, so I'm trying to get back to the beginning of this chapter. If you do this with Pathoma, if you actually know Pathoma with the depth of uh, like the kind of review we are doing, by the time you read first aid, it will read like a song to you. 
which it made my reading of a first aid very enjoyable just because I did this. Come on, where? Sorry guys, my computer. <laughs> yes, all right. Vasculitides, three categories, large, medium, and uh, small vessel. Uh, remember, medium vessels are the muscular, that is the, the boundary. Large, you're thinking about the aorta and its, its branches, then everything else from materials all the way is small vessel. Temporal uh, giant cell arteritis, uh, its association with uh, polymyalgia, rheumatica, you have, uh, and remember, it's, these are the same disease. Takayasu and uh, temporal arteritis are the same disease. And one occurs in younger people, that is Takayasu, uh, uh, giant cell in older people. Giant cell is the only one that can be both intracranial and extracranial. Remember, it can affect anything from the aortic arch itself to its branches all the way up. You do biopsy, you start them on steroids immediately as you plan to do biopsy. Sometimes biopsy can be, uh, you, you can miss the disease because it's just in certain segments. Same thing with uh, uh, Takayasu, it's, it, it's you, you, you don't biopsy Takayasu because most of the time it's on the huge blood vessels. You just go ahead and, uh, and treat. And the, sometimes Takayasu can present with a differential blood pressure on the upper arms, like on one side, blood pressure is higher. Sometimes it can lead to no, no pulse, very low blood pressure on one side, which can be confused with uh, aortic uh, stenosis, stenosis at some point along the, those blood vessels. Medium, Polyarteritis nodosa. Uh, we we I think we went through this uh, quite well. Polyarteritis nodosa. Polyarteritis nodosa. Multiple organs. It can be on any organ except the lungs. It can be in any organ except the lungs. Kawasaki coronary arteries do echo. The whole child is inflamed. Bueja stop smoking period. Then this small vessel vasculitis, please remember the difference between uh, Takayasu and Kawasaki mm. is the age. That's, that's a very big differentiator. Wagenous or Wagenous granulomatosis or granulomatosis because of the C anchor treated with cyclophosphamide. Wagenous will be in the nasopharynx, in the lungs, and in the kidneys. Microscopic polyangitis, P anchor, you treat with cyclophosphamide, you know, to expect uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. It can be, it, it will spare the nasopharynx, but you will have it in the lungs and in the kidneys. Chag Strauss, it's only limited within the chest. It will affect the heart and the lungs. P anchor. So P anchor in Chag Strauss and in uh, micro, uh, microscopic polyangitis. And remember the association between Chag Strauss and asthma. Asthma that is not, re not responding to treatment is possibly Chag Strauss. Hemlock shown in papyra, IgA, you have papyra which can be everywhere. Uh, most of the times after you've had an, a URI or sometimes because after you've had a GI issue. Hypertension, please remember to review the causes of resistant hypertension, and you're speaking about atherosclerosis in older people and uh, fibromyalgia, fibro, uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, sorry, fibromuscular dysplasia in uh, younger people. Uh, yeah, and then arterial sclerosis, please review this. It's, uh, I think this, this part is uh, fairly straightforward. The thing about this area is that when you review subsequent our chapters, a lot of the concepts here you will be called back to. And uh, Monken, you will be tested with an image of some sort, something that will be found most of the time in accidents. Remember the most common causes of uh, what, what predisposes to aortic dissection and uh, or aortic root dilatation, things like Muffin syndrome, ehlers danlos syphilis, and uh, 
Yeah, and the most common murmur that you will find, what's the most common murmur you will find if there is aortic dissection or aortic root dilatation? What's the most common murmur? It is aortic regurgitation. All right, guys, that would be it uh, for today. Uh, well, yeah. Hopefully, when we have a session, we will uh, go through some of the uh, some of these other um, areas. Maybe, maybe the last thing I should say, Dr. Job, with that cherry hemangioma, it's commonly in yes. the older age, and um, strawberry hemangiomas they are common in ch in children. So sometimes they tend to get those in the, in the exams. So keep an eye on that. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you so much, that's Doctor. That's an important differentiation. Yes. Thank you yeah, so much. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. I have. Uh, I wish you I all the presentation well. today, and I'm gonna look for you. I think you finish up cardiology. We're gonna do an EKG. I don't know if you have free time on 17th. We we'll, we can talk off this uh, this presentation then. We see if we can get you on board for the EKG yeah, sure, sure. in October. Yes, I will. I will look at my schedule to to see. Uh, I have had a crazy one this last four weeks, so hopefully going forward, if I'm able to create time, I'm happy to create time. And uh, okay. And uh, Pauline, and for, where is Pauline? I'm looking for you right now after this. I saw you. Yeah, on the, and for everyone else, we're going to have yes. biostatistics next week. So, if you can hear me, next week we have biostatistics. I'm sorry, I'm with my kid and she's making a lot of noise. <laughs> that is okay. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, um, logging out is just to run somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you next week, next thank Saturday. You. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Fiza, good to meet you here. <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah. Take care. I'll have yeah. a meeting now. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye.